Good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Sabir, pronouns he, him, and I direct events here at The Strand. Before we launch into a discussion of Josh Charles's new collection, A Year and Other Poems, I'd like to share a little bit of history about The Strand. The Strand was founded in 1927 by Benjamin Bass over on Fourth Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled from 48 bookstores until after over 94 years, The Strand is a sole survivor, now run by third generation owner, Nancy Bass Wyden. We want to thank all of you without our loyal community of book lovers, booksellers, and authors. We wouldn't be here today and we truly appreciate it. So tonight we are thrilled to have Joss Charles with us for discussion of her new book, A Year and Other Poems. Joss is the author of Field, a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize and Los Angeles Times Book Prize and winner of the 2017 National Poetry Series selected by Fadi Judah. She is also the author of Safe Space, a finalist for the Lambda Literary Award. In 2016, she received the Ruth Lilly and Dorothy Sargent Rosenberg Fellowship through the Poetry Foundation. Joss received an MFA from the University of Arizona. She is a PhD student at UC Irvine and currently resides in Long Beach, California. Joining Joss in conversation, later in the program is Jordi Rosenberg. Jordi Rosenberg is a professor in the English department at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and the author of the novel Confessions of the Fox, as well as a forthcoming hybrid project, The Day Unravels What the Night Has Woven, both from Random House. Confessions of the Fox was shortlisted for the Center for Fiction First Novel Prize, a Lambda Literary Award, a Publishing Triangle Award, the UK Historical Writers Association Debut Crown Award, and longlisted for the Dublin Literary Award. Jordy's work has been supported by fellowships and residencies from the Lannan Foundation, the Amundsen Getty Foundation, and the UCLA Center for 17th and 18th Century Studies. Tonight's event will also feature readings from Manuel Arturo Abreu and Julian Telemontes Berlaski. Manuel is a non-disciplinary artist who lives and works on unceded lands of Multnomah, Cowlitz, Clacamas, Chinook, Kalapoya, Confederate Grand Ronde, and the Confederated Selects Peoples and other Pacific Northwest First Peoples. Abreu works with what is at hand in a process of magical thinking with attention to ritual aspects of aesthetics. Since 2015, they have co-facilitated Homeschool, a free pop-up art school in the Pacific Northwest with a multimedia, genre, non-conforming edutainment curriculum. They also compose worship music as Tabor Dark. Julian Telemantes Berlaski is the author of of Mongolitude, Advice for Lovers, and Gowanus Atropolis, as well as the recipient of the 2020 Cy Twombly Award for Poetry and a 2021 Pew Foundation Fellowship. Julian is also the lead singer and songwriter for Juan and the Pines, whose albums include Glittering Forest and Saddest Songs, which is forthcoming. Julian's poetry was recently included in When the Light of the World Was Subdued, Our Songs Came Through, a Norton anthology of Native Nations poetry, and We Want It All, an anthology of radical trans poetics. And so our first reading of the night will be by Manuel Arturo Abreu, so please join me in welcoming Manuel to the stage. Thanks for that great introduction and for your work tonight, Sabir. Thanks, uh, Joss, for having me and uh, all the other readers and uh, Jordi, our interlocutor. And uh, thanks, of course, to the audience. I uh, have really fond memories of the voyage from the Bronx down to the Strand in Manhattan. And uh, yeah, it was a pivotal space for a lot of young poets and artists. Uh, I remember buying Mamie Burson Brugga's Nest there, a really important book for my uh, 
writing history. I'm going to read some poems from a manuscript that I was working on, which I'm working on with my friend Sharita Town to bring to press. She's a Portland artist. Uh, so yeah, I'm just going to jump right in. Uh, I chose some poems that uh, think about time and desire. This first one is called June. What is syntax without a body? What is friction without air? The moment our eyes touched, Ogun shot upright, realizing today is the day he ends his hermit time in El Monte. That day refracts across universes, singing its altars, unctuous with the salt of time. Yet the Bible only has two beginnings, the seven days and the garden, like how some say we're of two souls, but any thinking black person has more than two souls. At the gates of heaven, the figure maker will be asked to breathe life into her creations. The fires of hell lights objects from within. Figuration is a poor image of fugitivity. It's not that circulation bruises, not inherently. It's that folks don't want the hush money anymore. This is called Demiurge. Um, thanks to Claire Schwartz, who published this in Jewish Currents recently. I haven't uh, been sharing a lot of my poetry as it takes these more religious turns. So I'm excited to have that platform and this one is, as well. Um, yeah, this one's called Demiurge. <clears throat> Take my awe from me and I have no weapons. You put me in headless Eden. The world does not answer back. The heart makes a nothing of universes. Goad the latex sky. The river sprouts moons for no reason. I live for boxy smiles, you live vectorly, stealing mouths in sickly, dry radiance to speak of another's pain. I have no weapons. I have hurricanes in spider's nest. Even that they took. My audience is the dead who want to cling, but it's too shallow. The living can never find us here. Not while this world and the possible worlds are the dream of this creature, this bean counter in a steel cloud, demiurge, skin wearer. The moon carved us this tongue space of angel zones hardened by infinite geometries. Don't make universes out of nothing. Use what's there. Take it easy, but take it. Take my awe. All's where in love and for. This one is untitled. <clears throat> that the gods shrunk one of your destinies to a bile, lay it gradually before you like blood carried by wind. A choice I make, any little thing is an infinite sacrifice of possible worlds to enrich the toxic altar of the now. In one path, father's word means order conquers disorder. Another path, mother's silence, mother's chaos song yoked like a disciple to pleasure, to possibility, to the shape of memory. This poem is a uh, one of a series of devotional pieces that I've been writing to specific uh, people, to specific recipients. Uh, this one is to Alice Coltrane and to Yasangita Nanda. Her ashram burnt down uh, in the California wildfires of 2018. I never got to go, so it was pretty sad. Um, and the poem kind of starts from that uh, position of loss as a devotional position. 
to Alice Culture and Tudia Sangitananda in sorrow for the burned Sayanantam ashram. The Lilith moon of your harp lilt and angle of aligned planets thrum your name in concentric co-harmonic spirals falling upward. St. John lived in your negative harmony. Conflagrated pianos blossom from your every step. Ancestors blessed you with the reverse memory, the fractal geometry of lineages reflected in abstraction, the sound of light itself. Tears fall to my feet like a wriggling bug. This bottomless well of loneliness could be a neighbor. I gently smash lilacs against my face, calling out to you, dynastic like the city inside the yucca. This is called the harbor. One shadow said life is shadow between eternal shadow. Another color shadow said life is shadow between eternal shadow. Another color shadow said life is shadow between eternal shadow. Another color shadow said life is light between pillars, a gray cloud, the picture of rain. You make me. Plants make from the tears of angels hardened in infinite geometries. You would be a morpheme like points shall have no dimension. You make plants from the length of the language. The living can never let anything balance. Angled against plastic, the tragic pigeon wing in a toilet bowl, it lays clutched in his flesh as amber snowflakes. The father's collar is a long holiday at the altar of the nymph, the mold of invention, of feeling, of postponing by inflaming its own tail. The second you learn to take care of your sleep, glass fear of a kiss along your traps, your binding form to it like a boy's quickening eyes. A part stays behind, so the rest is left to the specificity of our lesser gods. Okay, I think that about does it for me. Thanks for listening, everyone. Hey, um, thank you, Manuel. That was beautiful. Um, I love the idea of writing devotional poems to humans. Um, so this is called This Writing Feeling. Um, thank you, Sabir and the Strand and Joss. Uh, it's really an honor to read with you. This Writing Feeling. Read this writing feeling I was trying to describe. You were sleepy, but I was saying how the closest thing I could compare it to is ASMR. Autonomous sensory meridian response which for me, when I heard about it, seemed to rhyme with this feeling I get when I encounter great works of art. Like those people, usually young women in YouTube videos, crinkling Christmas paper or running their fingers over combs while whispering in Balkan accents. And the feeling that this is supposed to produce. But when writing, it's not an auditory pleasure at all. In fact, it comes before the pen even hits the page or the fingers, the keys. It is a feeling come all over me. They, the ASMR people insist, it's not a sexual feeling, but we all know what saying something isn't is. Anyway, for me, it is a pleasurable and erotic and melancholy feeling more so a surplus of feeling that isn't art itself, but a visceral indication that the body is ready to make art, like getting hard or wet, but it's not sexual. I'm still learning what it means. Only began noticing it a little over a week ago, but I suspect it's always been there. Familiar with it now, I definitely already know it, but it's getting stronger now, the channel's clearer. 
transported to the ghost or the guest of my mind. Feeling come over me. Circumstance, ach, feeling come into me. Synapses disarrayed, but pleasurably. Tearfulness upon me, but no tears. As if about to yawn. Change of state. Deep sigh, like how Eleanor would say, when preparing to sing, imagine you are smelling jasmine. She said a rose, but I thought jasmine. My dog Snoo would often yawn. Dr. Ryan, the vet, said it wasn't due to tiredness, but to an adjustment, a change of state. So jumping into the car, she'd yawn, or waiting for me to prepare her food. So yawning come and all the hairs of my arms and legs standing up. The feeling obliges, even as I'm describing it. Art of the line, it's nothing doing. The feeling doesn't tell me anything about how to make the writing. It simply gives me the feeling I'm writing, or it's time to write, or what I'm calling this writing feeling, where I know I'm receptive to a force. I never believed in the muse and the kind of conceit of the outward origin of a work of art. Even as I wrote, there is never any inside to differentiate from the out. I knew things, that is to say, I wrote things without knowing them. When questioned on the very words I'd used, I could not say their meanings. Tansy, for example, or embrigature. Flock of stars. Should I be a shepherd, I and my flock of stars? Riding backward on the train through unromantic Newark to a garden in New York where I'd meet my friends, poets, the ones who knew what nectar tasted like. And once they'd taken the nectar into their bodies, well, others began to seek them out, longing for that sweetness on their tongue. The poets leaned against a wall of flowers and wore caps and blazoned with a single blue rose. Bees swirled lazily but purposefully about. I am accurate to my surrounds, they sang. I can swim in a drop of dew. I can make a flower spurt from my finger. Rock in a snowball, jelly in a donut. I heard a revelator say, there's gold in the honey of the bear. And my aspect is all simplistic. For one who knows how to ripen a fruit. This is for the poet David Larson. When the audacity of the seen world eclipses the glory of the love of God, then do my sleeves grow long. A glowing pear amidst my rubric green and crimson, clover and vermilion. But how does the pear taste, the angel wants to know. Unctuous, buttery even, soft on the tongue, like sugared sand. How that we cognize our surrounds, joy and pestilence, rats and clouds. What is it that makes a meadow? I mean, what halts the trees in place. When the mentalist starts to believe their own tricks, their own lies, they call it shut-eye. What is this atmosphere about my head? And what gilded forms unfold themselves to empty out their secrets for the daisy in my cap? Ripping up my heart, I found it pleasantly embalmed, discordian, apart from its network, feeding on fumes. Another poet writes about its heart in a poem that says, look at me, pick me. But where the poet has been long suffering, the poem just slaps a capo on itself and sings in a different key. New note, new ostensible heart. It's dark. It may freeze tonight. The poet labors over its poem. The poet is alighted with its situation. It may freeze. It may freeze. 
the basils and the cilantros that it planted in the planter it drug in from the street are still alive in the morrow of its mild suffering. And the letter that peeked out of the mailbox, a love long elided, and the part of its heart the poet had put on ice, defrosting now in the palm of its own hand. Star pocket. Ornament of the nebulon on which I rest my wrist. Pocket of stars. Outside the dream, but still dreaming, I was being kissed by one I love, but who in real life doesn't love me. Dream lover, a way to get high. I looked up how to get drunk without drinking and it talked about soaking a tampon in booze. Parmanji said, get intoxicated with God. I make my prayer and it's not a sacrifice. Impulse to order things, to check the stats of things, tick to click on the box, lacrimose, bargain my saneness, my senescence for a handful of likes. And lo, did I this very hour walk down a street called Columbus to a real river at Shakamaxin, the site of a treaty, where we said we would live in love with one another as long as the creeks should flow. Pilgrim's promise the promise of a lover. And like the vows of historical lovers, one that was writ on water. Dream lover goes to waste, creeks undergrounded into sewers. Um, I'll show you one more. Thank you for listening. Um, and thanks again to Joss. Congratulations on your new book. This is called Skyhammer. I took my sky hammer and pounded out a few choice clouds, cirrus and I don't know, nimbus, as in a god on earth, moving in space as a great auroral mist, a god who beholds the sparrows washing in the dusty gravel of Frankfurt Avenue, giving me cause to rant or giving me means to roll, ride with me in the shadowy afterworld, beyond the spider of a doubt, along a sidewalk littered with leaves. Don't be plain, said the cloud. Find the ornament that please you best, or elsewise, sugared in stars, go on and rail in a useless manner against the inevitable dawn time. People of the dawn come up drumming and beat on the pillow even if a drum is not available. Happy fortune, fortune has come round for you again in this pocket world of a minor horned God. I balanced my lunch in the arms of my ancestors, Tom cord grapes and weeping cherries. They were my arms, lackadaisic in the sky, 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 holding their sky hammer as if it were the baby Buddha. But really, I wanna be honest, I was in a rose garden with no roses and an outhouse called the Royal Flush. And I thought if there was a world beyond, I could become one of those assholes who gets their sugar from fruit and regard the one who points out my faults as a revealer of treasures and regard the one who points out my faults as a revealer of treasures. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, Julian and Manuel. Uh, it is, it's been such a pleasure just to hear you read, an honor to hear you read. Um, the launch is an excuse maybe just to, just to enjoy the reading. Um, and what an even greater honor to, to read on, alongside, beside. Uh, thank you to Sabir as well for, for the introduction. And uh, thank you to, to Jordi for when, when uh, the let me chat. Um, and of course, above all, thank you to everyone here who showed up. I wish it was in some kind of way in which one could clap and, and wave and, and wink. But this is very good too. 
I suppose I should say something about this book, huh? So here are another poems. Um, it came about uh, sort of during the year 2016 when this certain kind of rhythm started for me in, in, in my life and it felt out there in the world too. Um, that sort of just now is maybe coming to a close. Um, maybe the closure of the book will be the closure of the rhythm. And uh, I couldn't sort of leave that and I associated it with 2016. So I wrote these poems during that year, um, little notes uh, crumpled up and thrown ahead for myself to catch just now. Um, and uh, I edited them following that time um, and I couldn't kind of leave it, couldn't leave the time. Um, and then when 2020 happened, it felt like uh, this kind of um, affected, I don't know, uh, a, a reminiscence or something. It kept continuing this kind of uh, alienation. And that's when I wrote some other poems and a couple of Frentice piece poems that felt like um, the surplus, the excess, which made, which made the thing come together. Uh, the, the collection is, a, or the titular poem is, is arranged by month, um, Gregorian calendar month. Um, and so I'll say what section the poems are before, before I read a selection from them. This is from January. Desert hills, all aflame, the old hopes, an oak shook through a screen. Our separate smoke caught in the same ascent, months I move in you. Rosemary dead, Naomi at the clinic, Leia in hospice, in bed, and debt, throwing a book to the thresher a poet read, so much less than our nakedness, a chorus, a garland of changing names. A number of these poems are after poets, after friends, after poets who are friends. Um, this section is, this, this brief bit is after Salon. A current gives as much as it has given you, who I, I swear, saw gone round the tide pools yesterday at noon, but the world is gone, but the world is a lake, the shape of a lake. I also, with the gone, uh, that feeling, you know, of seeing someone or thinking you see someone who has gone and you think you recognize them. This is a recurrent thing. And that was one moment. And it related to the year and its excess somehow. Awaiting not clarity, but the shadow of something clear. All night, a hormone, I pant. It is not for want of understanding. I place notes to turn to after this. It's only appropriate given the, given the launch month that I read, March. Something accrues across this poems in each month, which gives a sense of the month. I don't know what it is I think March is, but something Baroque maybe. Baroque and a bit melancholic.
busied myself with days, leaflets, breathless days of belief or wanting belief, inscriptions of the coming heart, when boys would hold your comprehensible neck and place, boy, you were so much to be free. There's a kind of bullying poem maybe that exists. And I was thinking of this. It's a kind of variation on it, but not about the positions of the you know, victim and bully, but what moves through each, what is enacted in each. I visited family that month and I was thinking in part of uh, childhood trauma, I guess, and moving through those same spaces again, again, kind of repetition, kind of surplus. The ceilings I went under, dandelion stuffed in pocket, and what was it, dogwood? Mother stood, coordinated lemons, his hair a mollusk of vellum, I bathed understood unbelievable each emblem signifier me asleep in rooms I still sleep. And this comes after Manuel. The hour has an understory. I was a child pulling grass in the understory, dissembling until we met when I'd pull branch to ledge and sing all afternoon one song atop another. I had not begun to think past testament of what I didn't want. I believed sentences knew their end. I wore bathing suits still on the porch of world. I had not begun to answer what is the same. It is your mouth only that has changed. Joshua, oh, Joshua, oh. Jumping ahead, this is June. Yeah, June, I had moved back here to, to Long Beach, where I am, Southern California, where I was born and I'm from. And uh, I was leaving Tucson, Arizona, where I had gone to school and it was on fire. And I arrived in California and it too was on fire. Slept in cars, sheave of hair shook in rain. California, a fire, my mind entirely, a house of cinder in a house of cinder. Iterable rose, months massed in the anywhere. Shoulder me there. A scandal, three cartons, red in a hedge, in each the thousand eye research of flies. I was walking down the street and there was a hedge and there was three Pizza Hut boxes. And I thought, uh-oh, I gotta open those. And I did, flies in the face. These workless days a fit foam, the corner of my mouth on a floor, partita Thursday, my heart as big as it is over a toilet, 
forgetting that Bachman poem you love. Let's swap our shirts. Let us hold a coconut. It is dusk. October. October rose up, a coastline obstructing itself. I lost something in every room. They got in how, 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 how your dreams. When was it I knew my house to be falling apart? When did I lift an arm or bend backward, corbel like swung you your back to mine? When was it ever September, tides pouring over, when whales like men moved about the earth? There is this uh, square area near my uh, apartment I was at. Uh, it was called RV Milk Plaza of all places, now a quality plaza, I believe. Um, and some people resided there and had beautiful lemon trees and um, it was a gorgeous little space. And then the city decided to renovate it and uh, and it, the scaffolding went up and, and people were displaced. And then it came down one day and it was just a flat slab of concrete. Not even a bike rack. So I say not to reduce a poem to point of composition or place, but perhaps to leave it. Perpetual hair falls to the floor. Harpies make a nest there. No book whose margin isn't illumined with carmine, carbon, gold. When you get back, they will say, we tore down a house and built a statue of a house. December. In the enigma of a shadow of a window left open for wind to leave. In the thought that cannot account for form and having spent thought we encounter form only. In the distance between the hole of a stone and a dove within it of all we have imagined and we have imagined such distances, what is known and not known. You touch the stone. It could be any stone I live on. Such silence, sudden now in the clearing. A tarp chains the lot of our speech. Sunday, no women washing at the washing stones. The past is only the only mutable thing. A lone tanker in the waves swims. And I'll end with one of the um, other poems. This will be the last one. Thank you again all for being here. A note on form. Do not die, they say. 
at least today, full of scents, the pocket of city planted shrubs lining the street, not built, they say, but given, concrete, a paint bucket of a man spilling dashed lines to road. It is sense he makes, and the brush fire from hills, these two are desert hills, spills to the road where we do not speak of poetry, a bridge built to burn itself, not unlike a mine. So open fire, already open the fire, boundless and stoking. I do not know what else there is at times, narrative material split from raw material or preserving the split only to talk on a mezzanine later of men, the wood we live and under a star of branch, the unsayable possible in line to say this was our desire. Thank you. Well, thank you, Joss and uh, Julian and Manuel. That was also incredible. And thank you everyone for being here and the Strand for hosting and Sabir for all your work. Um, I'll get right to it because we don't have tons of time left. Um, I'm gonna begin with a question for Joss by way of her body of work more broadly. And I'll seed, seed the question with some tendrils that reach out to the other poets and their work. So when we're done with this question, we might go back and pick up those tendrils with everyone if we like. <clears throat> so I just wanna say a couple quick things. Joss has spoken about her previous work, Field, in a conversation with Kave Akbar as a process of structure and obstruction. One of these obstructions, of course, is the use of an invented Middle English, which, among other things, presses the reader to have to sound out the poem in order to understand the words on the page. Julian's of Mongrelitude does something like this as well, although differently. So there's an embedded opening to Julian here too. In sounding out the words of field, the reader ecstatically re-experiences the process of first coming to literacy, which is an amazing feeling. And moreover, this process demands a kind of vulnerability, I think, from the reader or a trans reader in particular, vulnerability that is to say their voice often conceived as the tell or the giveaway of assigned birth, something Julian approaches as well from another direction in My Voice Was Too Obvious, collected in Andrea Abbey Karam and Kay Gabriel's amazing collection, We Want It All. In asking this vulnerability of voice from us, Joss not only gives us the magical experience of relearning to read, but also in having us read out loud to participate in a broader impulse towards redistributing the traditionally highly individualized lyric I. This project of expropriating the personal pronoun makes me think of something Roberto Tejada and Susan Briant, I'm not sure how to pronounce her name, discussed in a conversation not too long ago, which has something to do with the poetic page as a lab for experimentation with implausible thought, which I'm just going to interpret as revolutionary horizons, such as the creation of a collective subject of lyric, or perhaps what Robin Kelly described in describing poetry more broadly as the emancipation of language. Joss describes her process of writing field as a kind of inversion of poetic process in general. She says, quote, you may start with supposedly concrete things like colors, lines, shape, perceivable objective data, and then work outwards to experience. With field, I wanted to operate the other way around to start with where one is coming from, circle the thing until something like a center is found. Unquote. So we begin, or Joss begins, or began, not with the object, but with a historical situation where one is coming from as the precondition for thought, not because historical situations are particularly transparent. Simone White, for example, has asked of what many would call racial capitalism if there is, quote, an idea more complex and unforgiving than the idea of race that we are still making every day. End quote. 
So we don't begin with a historical situation because historical situations are easy to understand, but because we can really only arrive at the concrete through a process of notating back and forth between an object and its slash our situation. There's a movement between the abstract and the concrete here that recalls to mind also Manuel's An Alternate History of Abstraction, which is a great performance lecture everyone can find online. Manuel's call for what um, they describe as a maternal abstraction rooted in African lineages of fractal architecture and lived space. So perhaps lived space is another kind of practice of notating between registers or abstract and concrete. In any case, field moves us through a series of abstractions and by way of a collective trans voice arrives at an encounter with nature or the thing we've circled in search of a center. A year too is concerned with arriving at nature as our situation, specifically climate catastrophe. There is the recurrence of fire, wildfire, flood, the fall of a Rome, as well as job precarity. Uh, job interviews, one stands out in particular, um, an interview at a trans flag waving coffee shop where the speaker won't get hired. And there's the question of form here again in the intersection of lyricism and catastrophic landscape. Kathy Park Hong writes recently of the lyric as ruin and as such an optimal form to explore the racial condition because our unspeakable losses can be captured through the silences built into the lyric fragment. So lyric is obsolete, destroyed and appropriate. We might not expect a year's note on form from which Joss just read a bit to begin with an exhortation or with affect, but that is what we get. Do not die, they say, at least today, full of sense. The pocket of city planted shrubs lining the street, not built, they say, but given concrete. Sorry if I put too much emphasis on the rhyme. I'm an early modernist, so I have to. Um, but here too, the concrete is something we arrive at, not something we begin with, not something sui generis, individuated, or separated from a situation. And we notice that concrete rhymes, perhaps importantly, with street, and in so doing makes an opening, I think, for concrete street politics, by which I mean an intervention into our situation. Joss speaks of, quote, the thought that cannot account for form, and having spent thought, we encounter form only in the distance between the whole of a stone and a dove within it, end quote. So form is graspable only through a relationship, not of anything so hackneyed as signifier and the thing signified, but a relation between a gap in the world or a kind of silence, perhaps following Kathy Park Hong and the pulse of life within that space, a hole of a stone and a dove within it. So now I want to turn to Joss and ask, a little bit, if, if you would like to talk a little bit about how your ideas about form and process have shifted in writing a year and how your thoughts on the natural world as both an object of poetic attention and as the situation of poetic practice may have shifted, modulated or echo between the projects. Sure, yeah, thank you, Jordi. Uh, I, I have been walking around today, ruminating, trying to figure out how to uh, maybe circle this and find the center as well um, of the question. Um, but I'm also interested in the tendrils uh, that, that you mentioned and, and um, uh, the respective portions yeah, that, that, that you invited Julian and Manuel to answer as well. Um, yeah, I suppose, well, I'll start maybe materially, like as simply as I can and then, and then move from there. Um, Maybe, yeah, maybe that feeling of reading field that you mentioned um, is something like invested in denaturalization as a gesture, something like this. Yeah, um, something about constructing something that sits alongside this one history of things in order to show its contingency, you know? Um, 
and that's maybe related to what you're what when you bring up Kathy Park Hong and this idea of ruin, um, that by affecting that, by affecting this kind of not even history, I think it's like an idea of the medieval, an idea of oldness that's not even correspondent to what really uh, to, to anything that happened. It, it's it's about the construction or something. Um, by by affecting that. Um, and speculating and pushing it some other direction. Yeah, that gap, that loss, um, the fact that there is no trans, uh, uh, I don't know, um, medieval text in the way that it proclaims itself to be um, falls into relief. And then that gives a kind of, um, yeah, pervasive sense of loss. Um, and if I were to try and distinguish that to a year, um, I think, uh, maybe I'd say something like I'm more interested in uh, the work it takes to naturalize at all. Um, and that that sort of denaturalization is itself, right? Just another kind of naturalization, just from a different position. Um, so I guess what I mean um, is, uh, yeah, back to rhythm, I guess, back to rhythm um, that, uh, um, field was a kind of space and um, a year is a kind of rhythm. And um, a rhythm sort of follows a logic that is, well, maybe not a logic, a, a form uh, that is anterior, yeah, to logic, to, to uh, the political, to um, thought, even as it's articulated in its terms. So I, I, I was, yeah, interested in charting, I guess, pulses. And, and the distance between them. Um, and so months became a really kind of like arbitrary way of signifying that, um, the way that months cut across a time that is in excess of whatever sort of divisions they make. And yet those divisions can be made to mark and, and show. Um, and in that marking creates an after, right? Creates a before. Um, and in that, I don't, I don't know that the gesture towards the after. Um, so like in context of mourning, which is one thing that is moving through a year, um, the idea that there could be an after to mourning, right? Um, the idea that there, you know, rather than that sort of melancholic, um, eternal uh, non-lament or something, you know, I don't know that there could be an after. Um, and so writing the poems in this way was um, maybe less speculative and more, um, uh, just hopeful, I guess, um, more, um, yeah, notes to turn to after this, like, like I, like I read, like it's something for a time that is not guaranteed. Um, yeah, that might be how I would begin to answer that question, um, to spiral to something like a, if not a center, like a coil, maybe it's just nothing there at the center. But, um, yeah, I might say something like that. Well, I, I trust the rhythm and the shape of your spiraling. And uh, um, I, I, I have like a million more questions that I could ask to everything you just said. I'm very aware of the time and I wanna make sure that we can open it up to the other, to Julian and Manuel. Um, and I don't know if anything I, said earlier is something that they might want to pick up on. One had to do with the question of the abstract and the concrete that was, you know, posed in relation to Manuel's work. Um, I love that um, they read the, the poem from which that line, figuration is a poor image of fugitivity, comes from. And I think that really, um, there's so much going on there around strategic opacities. I, I do, um, wonder if if any of that resonates or want uh, Manuel wants to speak any more to this idea in 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 their work on abstraction they say talk about this maternal abstraction as a kind of frame for praxis that kind of circumvents European genealogies of art and philosophy and abstraction becomes a kind of figurative and functional property and it's so important um, uh, and because it uh, describes something like dwelling or architecture or lived environments. But again, I think it points toward this question of the relationship between poetry and praxis, which I, 
I think so much of contemporary poetry is um, really trying to rework out right now. And, um, or, you know, I spoke a bit about Julian's, um, you know, work with, with questions of voice. And um, I love that Julian read in this writing feeling that that line, a surplus feeling that isn't art itself, but an indication that the body is getting ready to make art, like getting hard or wet. And then in the written, there's quotes around, but it's not sexual. I'm so curious what Julian means, you know, how Julian understands those quotes around, but it's not sexual. Um, but, but I think ultimately both this question of figuration is a poor image of fugitivity and the surplus feeling that isn't art itself, bo both of those lines are about this question of the insufficiency slash surplus of figuration and the relationship of all that to writing and may, maybe in terms of transness or maybe not. I'm sick of, does everything have to be related to transness? I, I beg of ye no, but um, like, do, you know, do we have to, but, um, but also let's. So I don't know if any of that sparks, sparks anything for anyone, but hello and thank you for your readings and who wants to yeah i'm happy to, to talk i love uh some of these thoughts that were uh surfacing i was really interested uh as josh described her process of kind of returning to these 2016 poems and modifying them uh, appending them kind of mo moving through the surplus in them to to find the the structure that was kind of happening at the confluence of like 2016 and 2020, right? Um, and I, I'm struck by this because in, in the process of writing that I draw upon, I, I think about, um, and I, I practice what Suzanne Cesaire calls Martinique and literary cannibalism, basically. So literary cannibalism for, Mar for Suzanne Cesaire had to do with challenging the idea of the original, basically, and treating all text that's found text in this way that uh, use the metaphor of consumption and, and digestion, uh, as well as kind of returning to one's own output in this sculptural way. So that's something that I, I do a lot in my writing. Uh, yeah, to kind of to take up these questions of value and the non-linguistic and obfuscation. So in my video, I talk about one of these like alternate histories of abstraction and calligraphy like the intentional, sometimes also devotional uh, move toward illegibility uh, when writing in a decorative way. So I, I'm also interested in like talking about built space uh, and, and nature, right? Like understanding nature as this legacy of, of bioengineering as opposed to this wild unpeopled zone that uh, the colonizer imaginary loves to, to uh, disseminate. There's something at work, I think, in, in Joss's descriptions in not only this book, I think it happens in all three of her books about the, the thing that built space is doing, like the kind of figure that built space makes, like it basically has to do with social choreography and convention in a way that ties really deeply to language. So it kind of makes sense that people in an iconic cultures, like, you know, certain Abrahamic cultures might use illegibly ornamented writing to like decorate the structures of their built space so this is something i think about a lot um so yeah i don't know maybe i'll throw it back to josh because i want to hear more about the, the writing process but maybe that's me being selfish yeah um thanks Manuel. yeah um i think aesthetics yeah aesthetics the arrangement of space right uh aesthetics and maybe that's back to that rhythm again it's uh not yet political or maybe not even yet general it's libidinal um yeah and and the attachment there doesn't necessarily follow the logic that purports its arrangement even as that logic comes later and tries to articulate it um maybe i'd say something like this and so then um in terms of the practice uh, and especially returning to the 2016 from 2020, trying to then weed weed through maybe yeah um, weed through that and find um, what was there that I did not know was there until yeah uh, 2020. Um, 
yeah, I'll, I'll answer it like that because I also want to hear from from Julian as well. If you'd like to talk to him, you don't, don't have to, of course. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll pick some of these threads up. Um, Manuel, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the idea of nature and I, and I, I love to think of, of, of that as connected, like you had said, to challenging the idea of the original, uh, which I feel like that's what trans people are doing. Um, challenging the idea of the original body, so to say. Um, I'll try to say this in a very simple way, um, thinking about, as you had asked Jordi, about the kind of connection of writing or of like poeticizing to uh, transness. And I think that, yeah, poetry is like clearly an act of transfiguration. And, you know, trans people know all about re refiguring. And I loved that line too of Manuel's about figuration and fugitivity, like escaping, um, hiding, maybe closeting even. So we know about refiguring, transfiguring ourselves, our, our orifices, our bodies, our parts. Um, and this, this transfiguration happens, first of all, with language before it happens anywhere else. And sometimes all we need is language. We don't bother with any further interventions. Um, so we're used to being able to like make these changes happen in the body just with language and in the social. Um, you know, that that some that for some it may like belie belief or so-called reality or nature. It's magic. And um, it's beauty too, like how Joss had said, I love that line about the garland of of changing names. It's an invulnerabilized fugitive position. And it's the, and in that way also a position of power. Um, an orifice is also like a place where things enter and exit, exit the body. Um, thinking about how Chrysosto Apache writes about um, the fistula, um, which is like meaning something in the shape of a tube, which strikes me as a very androgynous image, like both phallic and yonic at the same time. And it makes me think about um, Frank Fool's Crow, a Lakota medicine person who talked about the idea of the healer as a hollow bone um, through which something is allowed to come through. And, you know, poets are like that. Uh, and, you know, poets aren't or aren't only mediums, um, but we have to be available, you know, like not available to any old tramp spirit that wants to come through, but willing to combine our intelligence with a, a larger intelligence. Now, this is how I think about it anyway. Um, so the, the intelligence of the poem is not entirely our own. Uh, at least I feel that way about my poems. And that's what I was sort of talking about in this writing feeling, like words coming up in the poems that I didn't know the meanings of. Um, it knows things I don't know. And it, it creates worlds like pocket worlds that I can uh, go inside, that I can live inside. It's like a way of becoming a spirit. Um, it's a way of becoming spiritualized. Yeah, yeah I was just going to say, I really like that. And it, it makes me think about the functionality of abstract language, like, you know, what the role of the poet is in a socially relative context. I really resonate with a lot of the descriptions that Julian just uh, had about, about your work. And it relates to the devotional again, right? Yeah. And maybe that's like, a, if I return to, to, to Manuel, your, your question, like a architecture or something, uh, that's the coil, right? Maybe the, the substance, the line that makes the coil, but the center is, is absent, you know, and that's what holds it together. And that's the thing, maybe to move, you know, to move the center, not add on more coil. Yes, and spiral is like a divine geometry, you know, like Fibonacci style, <laughs> the shape of a shell. Yeah, speaking of other shapes of the writing, Joss, you mentioned that the um, 
the way a year in other poems is structured that you've got the 12 months of the year and then there's um what you described I think as like a surplus or these excess poems that made the I don't want to say container but the matrix of the year possible um I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about the process of arriving at that form or how you realized the year needed to be a year and other poems was it this kind of um, space beyond mourning, I think maybe you referred to, or um, how did how did you arrive at that shape for the book? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I, I suppose there's a very practical one, which is I got tired of writing the book, you know, and so then it was done. Um, but then I, I think maybe on the more my analytic brain thinking about it or something. Um, yeah, or maybe it's the same thing, exhaustion, exhaust, you know, um, like uh, that that uh, wanting to think the thought past its its limit, and then there one might encounter um, something better. Maybe that's that empty center again. Um, um, after one tracks up the coil, you know, that's maybe transcendence. Um, yeah, um, I also think just from 2020, looking back at that time, um, I saw things that I didn't see. Um, I wasn't sure if I wanted to publish a, a year at all. It was sort of just sitting in my, uh, I don't know, a, you know, a work that was sitting there. Um, to me, it didn't feel finished. It felt um, just like a poem that I had. Um, and it wasn't really until, yeah, around 2020, it was just before actually, um, it was 2019. Yeah, that's before um, that I that I decided to sort of use it again. Yeah, and add some things to it. Um, and that's uh, yeah, that feeling, that feeling in the air, maybe um, sounds like David Lynch or something. Um, uh, that that kind of feeling that that felt um, both in me and in the world or something. Um, whether or not it was, I don't know. Um, but it's in the book at any rate. Um, yeah, uh, and, and so th those poems, I kind of wrote them very much thinking about the year. Um, so like a note on form, I'm very much thinking about this thread throughout the book about form um, and wanting to look at that thread again. Um, and uh, it was like a song and I wanted to very much think about this sort of craze element that's running through the book and figure out how to con conclude that or not conclude it, but return to it maybe, uh, connect it again. Um, Meridian, um, uh, or a lyric is one of them too. Um, and likewise, yeah, uh, to try and figure out how to not resolve, but maybe cap it. Yeah, and there was something else too, maybe about the progression of the months that I, that I liked was I was also trying to find a way out of the little grief poemness of it without resolving, without giving into resolution. Um, and there's something about the month format that creates this necessary propulsion, this necessary conclusion. Um, I think too, there's a lot of a, you know, a blank and other poems. Uh, and I liked it participating um, or not in that lineage, in those lineages, yeah. Yeah, I love that. As a prose writer, I'm so jealous of the idea of getting to think a thought past the thought. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's really beautiful. Um, speaking of things that are past themselves, we're 10 minutes past when we said we would end. Um, so I will let um, everyone take a rest. Um, I want to thank all of the readers again, um, especially Joss, for your wonderful, wonderful work. Um, I am a huge super fan. Um, so this is very exciting for me personally. And um, uh, encourage everyone to buy Joss's new book and um, to purchase all of the books of the readers. I think the um, Strand put some links in the chat and I'm sure when this goes online, they'll put the links in the video. So thank you so much and congratulations. We should be in person. You should ha be having a cake right now. This is just 
you know. It is what it is. <laughs> Surplus. Yeah. Oh, we'll just echo Jordy's thanks. Thank you all so much, Julian, Manuel. It was such a pleasure to get to hear you read. Joss, congratulations. It was also a pleasure to hear you read as well. And Jordy, thank you so much for homing the conversation tonight. And of course, thank you to our audience for joining us tonight, both on Zoom and on Facebook. We appreciate you as well. So on that note- Thank you, everyone... Sabir. <laughs> we gotta thank you, thank you. No, thank you, that conversation is so good. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, Julian. Well, on that note, good night, everyone, and thank you so thank much. You.